All right. Um, so, intertextuality and this, uh, this is a concept um, related to um, drama theories, literary theories. I would like your responses to come first. What do you understand? What does the word appear to you like? Intertextuality. Okay, fine. Okay, one definition could be references. Okay, within the text. Okay, or to even to other texts. That's what you said. Now, uh, elaborate on it. Give me some examples, but not from six degrees of separation. You are correct, you are uh, absolutely on the mark, but can you give me some examples now, not from our play? Uh, in Galileo's uh, uh, this, in, in the life of Galileo by Brecht, there are the uh, Brecht takes many, uh, uh, many real life, not real life, uh, certain aspects. The, the signboards, the informational signboards on the placards. Uh, yeah, the pe as in the, the placards, the information there about when, uh, what happened. Uh, in certain points. Example of intertextuality. As in that, uh, that is taken from the actual uh, archives of the That's according to what you said. Mm. Oh yeah. Okay. Fine. Uh, so. Uh, what is, uh, in other words, as I understand you, Brecht uh, quoting something from the life of Galileo, from yeah, yeah what? Uh, uh, as in he's merging both uh, fiction, uh, as in he's merging, uh, he's merging fiction with. Are you aware of a term called historiography? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, no, I don't want to get into historiography, but you're closer to that <laughs> than intertextuality. Give me example of intertextuality from a literary text. Drama will give pose certain problems, but six degrees is uh, intertextuality and six degrees are so interconnected, we can't do away with it. But any example that you can think of, you gave me the definition, you say uh, intertextuality is references within texts or references to other texts, what would it mean? And what does it do? I will give you a small exercise also from six degrees. Are you having your text today? Good. Okay, please be ready with your text. Okay. Um, just a brief introduction to what is intertextuality. So, the term was first introduced by, are you familiar with this name? She is a French theoretician, Julia Kristeva, um, and uh, her article called um, Word Dialogue and the Novel. This is the article in which she coined the word intertextuality, word dialogue and the novel. And she derives from the theories of the linguist Ferdinand Saussure. And literary, literary critic Michael Bakhtin. Any idea, any anything that you can tell me about these two these two theoreticians? The notion of intertextuality um, is derived from the theories of Bakhtin and Saussure. Now, Saussure is known for he influenced Kafka, uh, not Kafka, I am sorry, Derrida. Yeah. Uh, when he deconstruction. Yes. So, Saussure is known for his theories of semiotics and science. Science as in S I G N S, okay. And 
Mark Twain is of course, um, famous for his theories uh, and the famous expressions dialogic, a text is dialogic, heteroglossic. and polyphonic. A text, a work of art, a literary text according to Bakhtin is dialogic, polyphonic and heteroglossic. What does it mean? Not mono, but di, hetero and poly. Okay, what does it tell you now? a work of art can be interpreted in several ways. So, it is speaks in several voices, get the idea? Okay. A work of art is not an end in itself, all right. Um, who uh, put forward the idea, the notion of death of the author? All these ideas are interconnected. You know, the French critic Roland Barthes, hmm? he put forward the idea of death of the author. Now, what does it mean? <laughs> Which author is that who is dead? The author has no right to say how something is interpreted. I mean, I mean, it is up to the person who is reading it. I mean, uh, once something has been written, Right. It's. I mean, you can't just say it's my intellectual property, and you can't force people to understand the text in, say, one set way. Good. So, um, according to Roland Barthes, the world, uh, the author dies once he finishes the product, and once the product goes into the hands of the readers. Okay. Then the reader has the right to interpret the work of art, the text, the literature, in whatever way he or she wants. So that means. That means that uh, uh, the, uh, the work of art is not an end in itself. Okay, it is open to and every reader now. Uh, therefore, these ideas of dialogia and uh, heteroglossia are important because every reader brings along um, with himself or herself several other you know notions and everything is brought or the way they read or they the way they approach a text is influenced by their background, their knowledge and their prior reading. For example, we might as readers miss out on several intertextual um, uh, references in 6 degrees of a separation. Is it possible or not? It is quite possible because it is so dense with references. What Guer wants us to see and the way we see it uh, may differ entirely, okay, because we may not be able to catch up with every reference that Guer is making. The same can be said of Tarantino's cinema, okay, packed with references, packed with allusions, it is a pastiche, it is a parody, right? Okay, several references. Um, people have done written books on Tarantino's cinema. The way he keeps on, I mean, Pulp Fiction is a definitive text of postmodernist cinema. He borrows from all over the place. He he plays with the structure and form of the film. Okay, and that's possible in literature also. We were talking about uh, the novel, um, the French Lieutenant's Woman, John Fowles, where the author uh, John Falls gives us um, a choice of endings. You reader has the choice to pick and choose the kind of ending you want and he gives us a couple of um, re um, endings, okay. not one definite and fixed reading. Okay. Now, um, coming back to uh, this notion, so Sasur and Bakhtian theories of language and literature. A work of art is open to several interpretations. Okay. So, that is the origin of intertextuality. 
Intertextuality is the shaping of text meaning by other texts. Okay, I would like you to again you know, go through six degrees of separation and find, feel okay, if intertextuality is the shaping of one text meaning by other texts, how is six degrees shaped by readings or readings of other texts? Okay. It can refer to authors uh, borrowing and transformation of a prior text or to a reader's referencing of one text in reading another. Okay. So, uh, meaning is not directly now transferred from the author to the reader, okay, where intertextuality is concerned, but instead meaning is filtered through a series of codes, it is mediated through, um, through multiple signs and codes and if we are able to get them, we are able to understand the text the way it is supposed to be read. I mean we are able to uh, uh, derive the ultimate pleasure from a text, that is the idea. I mean liter literature is, um, is done, you know people write um, novels and plays for a variety of reasons, but the ultimate aim is to provide enjoyment, aesthetic pleasure. And aesthetic pleasure can be derived if we are able to uh, sense the meaning through a variety of quotes, which a writer employs in conveying and in conveying certain kind of meanings. So, if the uh, reader is able to understand those quotes, if he is if he's able to break those quotes, all the signs and symbols, he is supposed to understand and enjoy a text better than someone who really does not. Um, who is not able to understand all those complexities which are implicit in a work of art. Okay, so, um, uh, two sets of theoreticians, structuralists and post structuralists. Now, when we talk about um, people like um, Julia Kristeva, they fall in the category of post structuralists. Structuralists try to use in the concept of intertextuality to arrive at a set of fixed meaning for the text. However, post structuralists, they, they use the term intertextuality to disrupt the notion of a fixed meaning. The idea is that the text can be interpreted in several different ways and therefore, there is intertextuality and that is how they use it. Structuralists on the other hand, they use it to find a definite meaning. So, uh, if we remember when we stopped, uh, we finished our reading of six degrees of separation, uh, I think uh, Krishna said it is open ended, it is not able, we are not able to uh, construct uh, a definite ending for this play, right. Okay, we do not know. Yeah, and that is the pleasure of reading, that constitutes the pleasure of reading, because um, like it or not, the author refuses to give us an easy closure, which is so po postmodernist in its form. Okay, so, um, akin to the idea of uh, intertextuality is also the idea of a pastish. Okay, so, what is a pastish? Mix of several what? Yes, Aditi? Several styles and forms. Several styles and forms. Give me an example of a pastish. Okay, you can also attempt. Example of a pastish. How, how does it, how does he do it? Um, well, I can only think of the, the style of narration from, because you mentioned Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I mean, the pace that varies, I mean, say, <laughs> okay, I am thinking of like, the long draw, drawn out conversations in certain parts, you mm -hmm. know, like for example, when John Travolta takes Uma Thurman to dinner, yeah. and diner, and how long and winding the conversations are. And you know the dance on the dance floor yeah. is a reference to what? 
Travolta's own image. We are talking yeah. about Pulp Fiction, okay? And it is a throwback on his Saturday Night Fever days, okay? So therefore, it's a pastish. I, a better example would be Kill Bill. Okay, why? Kill Bill is a uh, is a classic example of a pastish film. Why? What does he do? Mm, not just that. Exactly. Yeah, come out with it. How uh, Japanese samurai, the ideas of the samurai. Yeah, yeah. What Carry on. Bound by honor, duty, huh? blah, blah. honor, duty, blah, blah. Yeah, honor, duty, and uh, their exceptional skill. And the swords idea of this word being a very important uh, how does that become a past fish no it's there are different ideas first like she said of the uh, like he said of the bride mm -hmm. the, uh, the idea of uh, corrupted I mean like something that's supposed to that's meant to be pure I mean yeah. the bride on a wedding day bride on a wedding day yeah. bride, bride on a, a wedding day now see for example if you remember um, you just mentioned Japanese Samurai concept of honor, right? It's there. The samurai sword. Yeah. Ninjas, yes. In Kill Bill One, we have a, 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 an occasion to understand Japanese anime. If you remember, you remember that sequence. Okay, combination of Japanese anime. Then, in Kill Bill 2, there is a reference to uh, this entire mythology of western, the wild west, if you remember. Okay, and then you also have const concept of uh, black exploitation. What is black exploitation? Yes, sir, Isa. What is the genre of black exploitation cinema? Is it just ghetto uh, African Americans? Is it just that? Or is it just that? Not necessarily. Okay. But uh, a certain, yeah, certain uh, stereotype, of course, but you know, certain kind of lifestyle. So maybe you may not find necessarily black people in Kill Bill. Maybe not. Right at the beginning. But she is not a She's stereotypical. Not a yeah, person. yeah. But the cons, the lifestyle is there. You know, uh, the fist fight, the knife fight. Okay, you know that kind of. You know, people fighting all over the place. That you know. So what I mean by past is that in Kill Bill series of films, Quarantino, uh, um, sorry, Tarantino collapses several kinds of genres in a film, and then it becomes. Therefore, it can qualify for a good example of a past -ish. Okay, so blending of multiple genres. Okay, so that so intertextuality again becomes now. If I ask you to qualify or categorize six degrees, what is its genre? Is it a tragedy in the in the same style as the Crucible or the or Oedipus? No. Is it a thought provoking like Brecht? No. Yes. It does employ alienation, so it can't be a tragedy or a comedy in that sense. Yeah. So in the strictest it. sense, if I ask you to uh, classify it, what is what genre? Postmodern. I don't know. It's a, I would say it's a comedy. Okay, many people would call it a comedy. Akshaya has doubts, doubt written all over her face. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> yes, yeah. It's a tragic comedy. So what what I'm trying to tell you is that it's very difficult to uh, pigeonhole 
six degrees of separation and therefore, a pastiche is that work of art which is very difficult to classify or categorize. Okay, you, you do not know because you go and read the reviews of six degrees, it is very difficult everybody just differs on everything. Okay. You do not know what is it about, is it about racism, is it about uh, homosexuality, is it about uh, uh, class difference, is it about the snobbery of the upper classes, is it about the plight of the poor whites and the poor blacks in America, what is it, is it about the um, you know the art circle, the exclusive art circle of New York, what is it about, you do not know. How does it end, does he die, who was he? Okay, who was Paul? Does he actually die or is he out there duping other people? Okay, we do not know. Yeah. What we do know is that in some sort of way, he just barges, you know like the, the recurring word or the expression in six degrees is, um, you know a burst of color. Remember? Yeah, they use it several times, Flan uses it. Uiza uses it like a burst of color, Van Gogh a burst of color. He just arrives on the scene, bursts on the scene and changes everything. So, their lives are not what they used to be anymore. Okay. And they feel that in some certain way they have been touched by Paul's presence. Therefore, they do not want him to be reduced as a mere anecdote or an, as, a, as a mere um, incident in their lives. Okay, so, we do not want him to become just a, an, a, a dinner table conversation topic, okay, he meant much more to us. At the same time, they are, um, uh, they know that he has committed a crime, although inadvertently, okay, he is, uh, he is instrumental in uh, um, driving Rick to suicide, okay. So, he has to be punished for that, okay, but it is not a, it is not a tragic in the truest sense, it is not a real comedy also in the twist because uh, it, it, it is thought provoking, okay. it is it is not just generate, it is not just there to generate a few laughs, okay. it is not a preachy play. So, therefore, it is very difficult to categorize, it is a pastiche. Okay. So, intertextuality also in Julia Kristeva's work is a collage of ideas a collage of ideas, okay, a mosaic of quotations. Can you give me some example, six degrees of separation, a collage of ideas, a mosaic of quotations. You can consult your books of course, it is not an exam. Theoreticians also talk about uh, um, two kinds of intertextuality. One is uh, vertical and one is horizontal. Now, according to theoreticians, horizontal uh, intertextuality means uh, books referring to other books, okay, books making references to other books. Vertical textual intertextuality means books referring to other works of art or some socio-political situations. Okay. Now, other works of art could be music, cinema, painting, anything that constitutes art. Okay. So, vertical and horizontal. Now, um, Let us talk about um, uh, some you know uh, examples of intertextuality in six degrees of separation. Can you give me some, some examples and how and why 
Guare uses them. First, I would like to have categories instead of, you know, I, I remember I gave you this to ponder over, okay, over the weekend. So, just uh, tell me. Give me certain categories of references. Okay. Sociocultural. Okay. I will also give, you know, slash pop culture. Do you have literary references? Okay. Okay, political. Give me some uh, very prominent example. Uh, Socio cultural. Can I just take it here? Pop, art. Okay, okay. Now, uh, if you have your text. I mean, one very good example of uh, um, art and intertextuality is Kandinsky, the presence of Kandinsky itself, and that too double sided, painted on both sides, one abstract and another uh, more wild and vivid. Okay. So, suggesting both sides of personality, two sides to have. If you remember, Dr. Fine uh, or uh, yeah, Dr. Fine says it at one point. Uh, there are two sides to everything. Okay. So, throughout the play, yeah, we are made to understand that there are two sides. There cannot be one, um, you know, monologic uh, understanding of any situation, any person. Okay. So, therefore, you know, that, refer that stress on uh, dialogy, yeah, on the uh, presence of uh, heteroglossia, many voices. Okay. The, um, acceptance of a polyphony. However, I mean, at one point, uh, I am just tempted to talk about that uh, uh, dialogue, where Uiza says that it is very quiet when kids are away. It's at the, it comes at the beginning, the low noise quotient. Okay. I mean, is it so good? Of course, it is very orderly, but then what has that uh, brought you? Disconnect an alienation with your own children. Right. Okay. So, there is th that means there is a need for lots of noises, lots of voices on, in order to become more wholesome, more connected. Okay. You can live in isolation, in quietude or peace, but uh, in, in, in that process, you are just uh, disconnecting yourself from everyone around you. Okay. Uh, Dadaism, yes. You have cats, you have catcher in the rye. You have Jung, you have reference to, to references to Freud. Yes, you are saying something? Popular culture, yes. Greta Garbo, Greta Garbo, who was a known um, recluse, yeah, she just uh, uh, dis uh, disconnected herself from rest of the society, lived in her own ivory tower, okay. mysterious, enigmatic. Nobody never knew what she was in real life. But now, uh, you let's go to that point where he talks about Sydney Point here. Mm. Good. Page 23. Now, see, um, page 23, I will just uh, rattle off his list of movies. Among his 42 films are No Way Out, Cry the Beloved Country, Blackboard Jungle, The Defiant Ones, Raisin in the Sun, Lilies of the Field, In the Heat of the Night, To Serve with Love, Shoot to Kill, and of course, guess who is coming to dinner. Now, do you find some parallels? Guess who is coming to dinner? Do you think there is some intertextuality happening here? 
and then what does he do immediately after this? He makes dinner for them. Okay. And what is the theme and idea of guess who is coming to dinner? Not just preaching, but also accepting wholeheartedly with open and wide arms uh, people who are not who are not like you. Okay. Uh, people from other race, from other um, community, okay, that is important. Okay. And what is what is happening here? So, that this is a very direct reference, uh, yeah, it is a very direct intertextual reference to the movie, because here it is it is a very nice, uh, very clever spin on the movie, on the theme of the movie, because there Sydney Poitier's character is a very straightforward, a very nice, educated, well adjusted kind of black. Um, who would be accepted by anyone? Okay, but then here, Guire is making you know um, a very cunning reference to accept um, uh, to this person who is anything but that character from Guess Who is Coming to Dinner. Okay, he is not. Uh, 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 he is most unlike the character which Sidney Poitier played in Guess Who is Coming to Dinner. But then accepting this person is also. Uh, making a connection, right. It also tantamounts to making a connection with your um, people. Anything else that you feel that uh, uh, was uh, is worth mentioning here, some intertextual reference. Okay, 16th century Florence, all the restaurants. Genius at every corner, yeah, yeah. Why? How is it important here? Ripe. Yes. Good. Okay. Renaissance period. Okay. Sixteenth century Florence. Yeah. There is a genius in every corner. When imagination was at its peak, so many different ideas were cropping all the time, cropping up all the time. So now, therefore, and then. You look at this young man who is just bubbling with imagination, who makes such a passionate plea for <laughs> imagination, and then Catcher in the Rye. What is so uh, what is so intertextual about Catcher in the Rye, and why why do you think that uh, Guerre chose only Catcher in the Rye and not uh, Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn? <laughs> Yes, yes. So Holden Coalfield is a very good example of the chaos side of Kandinsky. He is uh, he is a classic adolescence uh, uh, um, who is a misfit, a non-conformist teenage. Okay, and that's what um, Paul is. Okay, because he is not he is not your average Sydney point kind of a good guy. Okay, he is. Uh, more in the category of Holden Caulfield. Caulfield. Yeah. Do you think that is any, any? Uh, it's like a very. It's a take on how English is, uh, as in not, I'm sorry, not English society, on high society. We Functions. Uh, both English hand last which is a pot of jam. We have these things, these tiny things which are so important to them and. Tropes of upper class. And, uh, yeah. yeah. English hand last shoes okay, uh, and uh, pot of jam. Okay, they they are like symbols of the upper class, okay, aristocratic class. Okay. And uh, perhaps that's uh, that's what he wants to be. You know, that's. Uh, I mean, uh, when I was reading the play, I also felt that Sistine Chapel and slapping the hand of God would it mean anything in the context, in the intertextual context of the play? Yeah. Uh, that we don't need six people. We can just. He didn't need six people to go and have. Just he go. Yeah. yeah. You can achieve the some near the near impossible by just reaching out. Yeah. So that could be. You don't even need a chain of six people. 
yeah, between you and the person who, with whom you want to make a contact. Okay, just reach out and touch it. Touch the impossible. McCarthy KGB. Um, you have assassination of President, attempted assassination of President Reagan. Also, the Soweto riots. Riots in South Africa. Gorbachev. Yes. Okay. All these events were extremely important when the play was written. Yes. John Lennon's assassination. Yes. He also makes references to Chekhov. Yes. And Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie. Uh, incidentally, uh, Goer is um, uh, both Agatha Christie and Chekhov happen to be personal favorites of uh, John Goer. So uh, that would be, uh, you know, just uh, acknowledging the masters, acknowledging people whom he admires so much. Okay. Yeah. I was also thinking of the quality of mercy is not strange. Okay. Now, this is and there is an irony on that at one place and the quality of mercy exists throughout in a very ironical fashion. Quality of mercy, um, the you know the New Yorkers with a heart that is what the headline screams remember. Okay, and then you, the, you go back to the quality of mercy is not a strain. Uh, uh, in the beginning, you have those people who are uh, ready to welcome a rich man's son uh, because he is wounded and he has been mugged, and uh, uh, they give him shelter, they dress his wounds. So the headlines say, uh, "New Yorkers." Who says New Yorkers don't have a heart? Okay, at the same time. Um, they are also, uh, you know, when they go after him, they are quite ruthless. Yeah. So, who says that quality of mercy is not a strain? Yeah, that is a, yeah. yeah no, no, I am not, I am saying, I am asking the question. I mean, quality of mercy, I mean, it is it's mentioned here in a very ironical way, in a very ironical text, intertextual way. Um, Anything else that strikes you as very, very when uh, they are having the converse, the final conversation over the phone, he says, I just read Andy Warhol's diaries. Yeah. And Andy Warhol, great pop culture artist, and he is known for that painting the yeah, the the soup can and also those beautiful Elizabeth Taylor and Marilyn Monroe collages, paintings. Okay, but what else? The famous quotation. What was it? Famous quote by Andy Warhol. Fifteen minutes of. Okay. Do you think there is some kind of an of a connection? Paul. How? Yes, he wants just that, uh, you know, uh, a one night connection with the very rich people. Okay, just that. He does not want anything more than that. Yeah, but he wants to experience that kind of life which he knows that, uh, that otherwise he would never have the opportunity to explore or to live. Rainbow Room is a, it's, it's an extremely upscale kind of a restaurant, ex extremely expensive. The only way uh, someone like Paul can have access to Rainbow Room is by robbing someone, some gullible person and uh, Rick and Elizabeth just happen to uh, come in his way. Yeah. So, therefore, that um, so Andy Warhol's reference is important, I think, because of this entire idea of 15 minutes of fame. Also, when he is um, plastered all over the newspapers, that this person, okay, he becomes famous, although uh, 
infamous, <laughs> but but uh, 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 that's what Andy Warhol says that it really doesn't matter whether it's fame or notoriety. Yeah, as long as people know about you, it's okay. So Paul also is following Andy Warhol. So therefore, the reference to Andy Warhol was also a, a known homosexual. Okay, so yeah, yes, Rehan. explicitly calls them star fuckers. Yes. Uh, and alludes to this entire uh, culture of name dropping. Name dropping. Name dropping and then wanting to associate with like people the higher. With, with celebrities. celebrities. Yes. Yeah. So this entire culture where people are falling over each other to become associated with celebrities, to come into limelight. Also, uh, deep down you have that deep dark desire to star in cats as humans. Okay. However brief, you know, you know, just as extras, but you are there on the screen, people know you, people are, people are going to watch you. That alone, mm, you know, uh, gives them a kick. Okay. So, again a reference to 15 minutes of fame. So, now you see how the and again, as I was uh, talking to you earlier on, Walter Benjamin's famous quote: "In this age uh, of yeah, yeah, of mechanical reproduction, yeah, the my only copy of my dissertation is lost." Okay. So uh, that is another spin on Walter Benjamin's famous essay, uh, "The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction." Intertextuality, to conclude, um, has been used by several writers down the line for several purposes. For example, John Steenbeck in his East of Eden, um, he says the entire story of uh, uh, the biblical genesis in, uh, in America. Okay. And then you have uh, James Joyce, Ulysses, which uh, is a, uh, you know, a take on um, Homer's Odysseus, okay, set in modern Dublin, of course. You have a, an, a novel like A Thousand Acres. Are you familiar with this, with that novel, which is, a re, which is the retelling of the story of King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear, okay, but told from the point of view of the so called wicked daughters. Remember, King Lear had three daughters, one uh, <laughs> is a model virtuous daughter and two very wicked selfish daughters. So, the story is told from the point of view of those daughters set in contemporary um, America. And then of course, you have the wide Sargasso Sea, which is a retelling of the Jane Eyre story from the point of view of Bertha, the, the mad wife, Mr. Rochester's mad wife, who was uh, never allowed to step out, who was always kept hidden in the attic, so that she does not interfere with Mr. Rochester's day to day life. And um, you know, Mr. Rochester can also marry in peace, but that does not happen in Jane Eyre. So, uh, the White Sargasso by um, Jean Rees is a, a retelling of the Jane Eyre story, but from the wife's point of view. Any questions, any comments? So, several, I mean, I, when you read uh, uh, Six Degrees of Separation again, you will find that uh, what uh, Julia Kristeva says, a collage of ideas and a mosaic of quotations, everything would, is there. It is all present here. Okay. So, read the play when you, you know, the next time you read it, read it from that perspective. All right. Thank you. <laughs>